Good morning. How are we today? Good? Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, uh, we are pressing on in our second, I think, to last week in our series called Paradox. And we're talking about uh, the tension that's sometimes created when the world around us asks us to live in one fashion and the call of Christ in our life uh, demands that we live in another way. And uh, sometimes these things don't always uh, line up against one another. Uh, culture is not bad, as I've said before. Uh, it just is. We're a part of culture. But it is important to, to realize that, that not everything that uh, the world calls us to do, uh, we can go along with as believers. And this creates tension in our lives. This creates this feeling of, of, of anxiety and stress, perhaps, as we try to follow uh, people that have a temporal demand in our life and someone that has an eternal uh, call on our life. And uh, historically, inherently inside of a person, uh, given to you by, by God, and it's very natural, it's also found in, in animals, is this response. When you encounter a stressor or an anxiety or a fear, you kick into what's called fight or flight. Now, back in the day, and I mean back in the day, like loincloth days, we triggered fight or flight when we came across like woolly mammoth. Oh my gosh, should we run or should we try to kill it and eat it for like woolly mammoth steaks? Or, oh my gosh, saber-toothed tiger, run, everyone, you're slower, I just have to be faster than you, yay. This is the fight or flight that we dealt with initially. But now fight or flight is, oh my gosh, I got a text from Rodney, what does he want? Like, now I kick into fight or flight. I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong this time? And so fight or flight's a little different. You get, you get called into your boss's office and that, that sensation of, of defense, right, kicks in. Or you, uh, you, you, you're in a fight in an argument with your spouse and that fight or flight kind of like, is, is it worth it to say this? Should I not say this? Um, perhaps the wisdom in that is flight. If you take nothing else, maybe flight is good there. Uh, but oftentimes we feel as though uh, when we encounter this tension between the world and our faith in Christ, uh, it can trigger this fight or flight. Like, what should we fight for? What should we, what should we argue for? What should we stand for? And then what should we run from? What should we flee from? What, when should we back down? And I think in navigating this, we can find a way to navigate uh, with courage uh, the anxieties and the stressors in our life. So we're today, we're in 1 Timothy, uh, we're in chapter 6, uh, verses 11 through 16, and I want to talk today about when do we run, when do we fight, and how long do I have to do either? Uh, verse 11 of 1 Timothy chapter 6 says this, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So when do we run? When do we run? Last week, Paul brought up uh, uh, the, the main reason why Timothy is going to Ephesus, the false teachers and the arrogance and the greed that, that was going on there and, and that he was supposed to address. And, and he's reminding Timothy that he's been called to a higher purpose. And one of the ways we know that he's being called to a higher purpose is what Paul says in verse 11. He says, but as for you, O man of God. Man of God is a big title. It's a big deal. It's not like, O reverend or O pastor. Like, that's very nice. Thank you. But, but it's like a major deal. Like prophets were called man of God. Moses was man of God. So what Paul's doing here is he's giving Timothy quite the, the, the compliment by calling him man of God. And there's also a word in Greek that's untranslatable, but it's where we get this word O, oh, like O oh, man of God. Paul's like busting at the seams with pride over his protege. Timothy's matured, he's grown, he's about to take on this major task, and Paul is so stinking proud of him that he's like, oh man of God. Now you would think that in calling him, O oh man of God, you would think that Paul's about to be like, all right, dude, so what we're going to do is we're going to grow the church like this, we're going to do this, you're going to do a great job, everything's going to be awesome. 
You're going to run those uh, false teachers out on a rail. We're going to take back that church. It's going to be great. But that's not what Paul says. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. It's kind of a letdown. Big compliment and then run away. Run away. Why does he say this? Why does he say flee these things? It's because of what these things actually is. Now, there's some things in the Christian life that we should challenge head on. And we should stand up and resist. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And there's some things in the Christian faith that for one person might be a temptation and a struggle and anxiety-inducing, and for others, it's not like that. So in my case, I've never struggled with alcohol. I have people in my family historically that have. But I've never been tempted by it. I've, I've never found any drinks that I like, so I guess that's part of the aid. Now, if Diet Coke was, that would be a problem. That is something I have an issue with. But I can go to uh, places that serve alcohol, it doesn't bother me. But there's some people, very godly people, that that's a big stumbling block, that's a temptation. Maybe it's something from in their past before they knew Christ, maybe it's an ongoing struggle, whatever. But that's something that, that they have to be careful, they have to police in themselves. But Paul is saying here, there are some things that are universal in the Christian faith that every single person, even people called man of God, should run from. And it's what's described in chapter 6, verse 2 through 10, what we talked about last week. This temptation to self-sufficiency, this temptation to pride, to arrogance, to greed. Those are things we should all run from. There are some things so alluring to us that we can't resist it if it's dangled in our face for a long enough time. So Paul's cautioning Timothy. He's saying, don't fall into the same traps that the false teachers fell into. They fell in love with money. They fell in love with prestige. They fell in love with their own pride. And you're going to go in there and yeah, you're going you're to clean things up, but don't fall into the same trap. Don't fall into the same trap. We have to understand as Christians that there are some things we cannot hold up under. And there's two reasons for this two reasons for this. One, two reasons why fleeing in this case is a valid response. One is that fleeing doesn't really change who you are. It doesn't change who you are. Notice that he calls Timothy, O man of God, before he tells him to run away. Running away, staying and fighting, doing jumping jacks, doesn't matter. He's still man of God. Now later on he's told to fight, but whether we're fighting or fleeing, whether we're pursuing or taking hold of the identity, our identity is in Christ, and it's secure there. It's not based on what we do or don't do. It's in Christ. Christ won for us this identity of, of righteousness and holiness before our God. We are accepted by God if we have faith in Christ, based on his death and burial and resurrection. If you haven't put your faith in him, then your identity is not secure. If you don't trust in Christ, then yeah, you, you maybe have some things to worry about. But in Christ, our identity is secure. So I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I don't have to prove myself to anybody. Now, yes, sometimes I struggle in this. But I don't have to stand up to certain things. I don't have to stand up to temptations and show what a mature Christian I am now. Running is a perfectly valid response. You don't have to try and prove to Jesus that you're a more mature Christian than you were this time last year. Oh, well, I don't have to run from that anymore. The fact that you think you don't might not be a sign of spiritual maturity, it might be a sign of pride, which would be immaturity. He has nothing to prove. The second reason why we run from something is to pursue something else. Verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. You run from something to pursue something else. You avoid temptation, you avoid that anxiety, you avoid trying to take control, so that you can pursue something else. This is a positive command. Often in, in, in Christianity, in the way that it's portrayed, is Christianity is this, is this faith of don'ts. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, be boring, have a great life. But the reason why we're told not to do so many things in people's perception is because it frees us up to pursue that which is life, that which is good. That often gets left out of the don't, right? And the six things that are mentioned here, the righteousness, the godliness, the faith, the love, the steadfastness, the gentleness, one commentator called this the summation 
of maturity in the Christian life. If you're growing in these areas, you're a maturing Christian. This is kind of a way to check in on your spiritual health. Are these things happening in your life? If not, they're things to pursue. You see, when we flee from something, we run towards something else. We run towards someone else. We run towards Christ. Now, uh, there was a, a war uh, not too long ago, the Korean War, and in it, some of you are familiar with it, I'm sure many of you are, uh, the, the North Korean army invaded the South Korea, uh, country of South Korea, and the UN deployed troops, and they pushed back the North Korean uh, uh, army all the way to the Chinese border, and then China kind of jumped in and, and pushed the UN troops back, and then you kind of have this, uh, uh, what's it called, a, a demilitarized zone there in the middle, right? And that's kind of where we sit today. Now, when the United Nations forces were retreating after the the, the Chinese were pushing them back, uh, one general was interviewed, and he was asked, like, what's going on? Why are you retreating? And his response was, we're not retreating. We're advancing in another direction. (laughs) And that is basically what the Christian faith is. Sometimes it feels like retreating. Sometimes it feels like you're running away. You're not running away. You're advancing in another direction. You're advancing towards Christ. So how do we flee? How do we retreat well? Well, one, we need to know when to run. You've got to know when to run. Timothy was told explicitly what to flee from in this case, the allure of self-sufficiency and material gain in his ministry. Later on, he's told to flee youthful passions. In 1 Corinthians, we're told to flee idolatry and sexual immorality. So taking all of this together, we get a general idea of what we're supposed to run from. When you are hit with anxiety, fear, stress, our tendency is to do one of, of, of a few things. One, we try to take control of the situation. So we maybe turn to an idol, such as money, or power, or prestige, and we fall back on that and say, that's how I'm going to right the ship. I'm going to do what I've always done. I'm going I'm to use my wealth or my power or my authority, and I'm going to right this ship. Or we turn to an addiction. I can't handle it right now. I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm going to go back to this thing that makes me feel good for a little bit of time, but I feel empty afterwards. Or maybe we just turn to buying things, filling that void with stuff. And Paul's saying when you hit an anxiety or a fear or worry, something that that kind of triggers that inside of you, that stress, don't turn to those things. Don't run to pursue those things. You run to Christ. You turn to pursue Him. We need to know when to run when we identify those things which make us want to turn to our destructive habits. And so then we turn our running into a pursuit. Our pursuit, excuse me, we turn our running into a pursuit. Let those things, that your, your desire for self-sufficiency, your, your, your overwhelming passions and emotions that sometimes get out of control, let them push you towards Christ. Our tendency is to think that, that Jesus doesn't want anything to do with us when we're struggling. He only wants something to do with us when we're, we're doing well. And that could not be farther from the truth. Jesus desires, and we'll talk a lot about this later, but Jesus desires to be with you in the midst of your struggles, in the midst of your challenges. That's why he died for us. He didn't die for us so that he'd set us up well and be like, all right, you're on your own, kids. Pursue him. Go to him with whatever your darkest, dirtiest, dangerous stuff. And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I know. You don't have anything to prove to me. And then run to a prepared position. So historically, the best generals, all of them probably at some point had to retreat. They had to fall back. And a good general is not just going to run. They're going to retreat to what they call a prepared position. So what they'll do is a few, uh, a few days before they're running away, they're going to dispatch some soldiers to behind the line. Say, hey, about 10 miles back, 5 miles back, there's a river. Why don't you start digging some trenches on the other side of that river? We're going we're gonna to fall back on a strong position. Or there's a big old hill back there. We want to anchor ourselves on that. Go back and build a supply base there. That's where we're going to fall back to. You want to fall back to a prepared position so that when you meet the enemy again, you are stronger than you were before. So you need to have a prepared position. When you run into something that causes you fear and anxiety and worry, do you have a friend that you can talk to? You have a friend you can turn to that you've got prepared, that you say, hey, you're my person. You're my guy. You're my girl. I'm going to give you a call that when I'm stressed, you're going to be the person I unload on in a good way. Or maybe you have a place in your house that you kind of go to that's kind of peaceful, kind of quiet. And so you turn to that. And you know that when you're there, you, you can set aside some of your fears and your worries. It's a fortress for you. 
Or maybe your prepared position is a little bit more abstract. Maybe your prepared position is scripture that you've memorized. Or Bible passages you've got put up around your house that you're like, man, that's what I'm going to turn to. And they're, they're prepared for me when I'm stressed. Don't wait until you're stressed to figure out what to do. Prepare a position for yourself. So that's how we run, and that's how we run well. But when do we fight? When do I actually fight? Paul actually identifies a time and a manner when we continue to fight. And it's important, since today we're talking about having courage in the age of anxiety, it's important that we talk about the fact that courage is not natural. Fight or flight is not like courage and cowardice. That's not what it is. Fight or flight kicks in for survival. So I will fight for something if it's about my survival or if it's about the survival of people that are, are a part of my tribe or a part of my group, so like your family. You might fight for them. Outside of that, probably not going to fight for much. I'm not going to fight for much. And I'm certainly not going to fight for abstract concepts. That doesn't come out of fight or flight. Courage is invoked when you recognize that there are things more valuable than your own survival that are worth fighting for. That's why soldiers are courageous, right? Now, when they're in the moment of battle, yeah, fight or flight kicks in. But the desire, the, the, the will to, to go to a foreign country and to, what we say, defend America, they're, they're not defending our soil. What are they defending? They're defending values and concepts, abstract ideas that we believe are good for the, all of humanity. And you have to muster courage for that. And so Paul says that if we're going to muster courage in the face of our anxiety, we can't rely on fight or flight. And he gives us three things that we should fight for. And one, we should fight for hope. Look what he says in verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Then he says how? Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. To which you were called. The first command is to take hold. This is a violent image. It's a fighting image. Taking hold of something. Eternal life that we've been promised is something to take hold of. It's the hope that we have. It's the, the hope that we know that, that no matter what we face in this life, we know our God's going to rescue us. We know he's going to deliver us. We know that we have an eternal future with him. We're not just temporary beings. And when we fight for hope, when we fight for this, this future promise that we have, we're encouraged. We're built up. You might say, well, Travis, if hope is supposed to fuel us, why do we have to fight for it? Well, if you've ever encountered anxiety, stress, worry, depression, one of the first casualties is hope. This idea that tomorrow will be better. It's tomorrow that things will ever be back to normal. Hope is one of the first things to go. And so that's why you have to fight for it. We have to recognize that hope is something that's fragile, despite its value. Robert Yarborough, a commentator, points out that, that hope, uh, that fighting for this eternal value, this eternal idea, is something that's evidenced in Abraham. When he goes to sacrifice Isaac, He's promised a son. He's, this, is, this is the guy. This is, this is going to be the one that God promised me. And God says, I want you to take him up to this mountain. I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham says, okay. Now, some people would be like, oh, well, did he just think that God was going to stop him? I don't think Abraham thought that. We don't know, but I think Abraham thought that God was powerful enough to bring him back from the dead. That the promise was eternal. The promise was immortal. Some way God was going to do something. The world by its temporary nature will force your head down to look at temporary solutions, temporary ideas to handle your anxieties, your stress, and your worries. So we have to fight to keep our head up. We have to fight to keep our head on our hopes. So this means being generous with our time, with our energy, with temporal things. We've got to be generous with them. And so we keep our hope. We have to keep in scripture regularly, in prayer, constantly. Why? Because our hope is there. Those are one of the first things to, when you're busy, when you're stressed, when you're overwhelmed, you're like, I don't have time to be in the Bible today. Now, you should be in the Bible for sure if you're stressed and worried. This means intentionally not fulfilling uh, desires for new things, but giving things away. We have to fight for hope. We also have to fight to persevere. Look at verse 12. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Paul's reminding Timothy, hey, you made a confession at one point. Now, this confession that he's talking about is probably when Timothy first came to Christ. He probably stood up in his church where his mom and his grandmom went to as well, and he, he professed, said, hey, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. 
But then later on, Paul and Timothy went on travels together. And if you know anything about Paul's journeys, Paul is constantly getting into trouble. It's like a habitual thing for him. It's like it hasn't been a good day unless someone's thrown a rock at me. And so Timothy goes along with him. And so in front of these enemies, Paul and Timothy make the good confession. They're saying what they believe. But now Timothy's headed into a different situation. He's heading into a church that Paul started, and he's heading into a church where, because of the false teachers, he doesn't know who his friends are anymore. He doesn't know who's been swayed by the false teachers. He doesn't know who's leaning that way or leaning towards uh, the, the more orthodox values and beliefs in the church. And when you run into the unknown, when you run into a situation like that, it's harder to keep your confession pure. Because when you're around friends, super easy. They know what I believe, I can be free, and I can be open about it. When you're around enemies, when you know everybody already doesn't like you, it's super easy to continue to not be liked. I call that aggravation, and I do it all the time. I'll I'll stick by my guns just to bother you. But when you're in a crowd of mixed people, and you're trying to lead them, it can be real easy to kind of soft-pedal some things, try and win people over, and Paul's saying, don't do that. Keep going. And because the temptation, when you encounter something new, unknown, that fear that comes from the unknown, it kind of robs you of this desire to persevere, to stick with it. Because you're going to do what you got to do to survive. You're going to do what you got to do to stick with it, to, to just get by. And Paul's saying, no, 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 in that case, you've got to fight. God's calling us to fight in those situations, to persevere in our faith. And the way he says to do this is to look back on your confession. Don't doubt in the darkness what you heard in the light, or to change it, don't doubt in the darkness what you professed in the light, what you said when everything was going well and you were a follower of Jesus and you were, you were on fire for the Lord. Don't doubt that when things get hard and your warmth towards Christ feels cold. Keep going. Keep persevering. So we fight to persevere. We also fight to succeed. Look at verse 13. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. Paul tells Timothy to keep the commandment, which is basically the summary, the summation of everything that Timothy has learned from Paul and others about following Jesus Christ. Keep the commandment. Stick with it. And this is the measure of success for Paul. And this is going to be Timothy's measurement of success as well. This is your measurement of success as a believer. Am I a good Christian or a bad Christian? Do you stick with it? Do you keep going? If the answer is yes, then guess what? You're a good Christian. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Stick with it. And Christ plays a dual role for Timothy and for us. One, he's our example. He's our example. Look what it says. Who in, Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. Jesus could have soft-pedaled who he was. He could have said, yeah, you know, Pilate, look, I'm not really a threat to the empire. I'm a different kind of king. Trust me, it's going to be fine. But Jesus didn't do that because he knew he had to die. And so when we are before other people, when we are faced with our anxieties and fears, we don't cower in fear. We have courage. But also Christ accepts us whether we succeed or not. Jesus is our mediator. He's our mediator between us and God. The challenges, the struggles that you run into, he went into through them too. Because the tendency for us to, and this is the way I read this initially, where G, uh, Paul says in verse 13, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and Christ Jesus. I read that and I think, boy, I am, by God, you better do what I want you to do, is what I hear. And maybe that's what you hear as well. Is this idea that Jesus is going to come after you if you don't win, if you don't succeed, if you don't grow this church, if you don't get rid of these false teachers, he's going to be mad at you. But that's not the case. Paul's saying, look, I want you to know that Jesus is your mediator and that he's seeing everything you're going through and he knows it's hard and he knows it's a challenge and he knows it's difficult and he's with you and he loves you and he's going to keep up with you. And notice he says, God who gives life to all things. You know what that means? Life to all things? That means even the things that we undertake, the successes that we want, the things we want to grow, the, 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 the disciplines we want in our life, the ministry that we want to have happen, the relationship that we, we seek with our spouse, these things that, that we want to be life-giving. Guess what? God is the one who gives those success. Those are the, he's the one in charge of that. 
Success and failure doesn't rest on us. We just have to be faithful. Be faithful and be patient. So Travis, how long do I have to keep this up, this fight or flight life? How long do I have to keep this up? Well, I have awful news. Verse 14. Verse 14, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Could be like five seconds from now. Could be much longer. In fact, in the history of the church, it hasn't happened in anybody's lifetime, Christ to return physically. There's this uh, story from, uh, from World War II. It happened at D-Day, a, a, a glider unit. So uh, kind of like paratroopers, but they rode in on a, on a glider. They landed, and they were supposed to seize control of a, a crossroads. And it was so the two beach, uh, beachheads could link up and continue on the advance into France. And they were being attacked heavily by, by the German army, a counterattack. And they, they radioed back, and they were like, hey, when are we need help? Like, when, when can we, what do we do? And his response was, the general's response was, hold until relieved. Helpful, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Hold until relieved. And that's the command that you've been given here. You hold. You stay in the fight or flight. You, you keep going until you're relieved, until Christ comes in the flesh again or he calls you home. That is what we do. We hold until we're relieved. We long for the return of Christ. We desire for him to be near to us. But at the same time, we're hurting. We're in pain. So this begs the question, what in the world do we do? What's going to keep me going until then? Well, this is where I think the paradox of, of courage in the age of anxiety also meets a theological paradox. And it's this paradox of God's eminence versus God's transcendence. Now, the eminence of God is this idea that God desires to be near us. He wants to be with us. He wants a relationship with us. He's revealed himself to us. That's God's eminence. God's transcendence, on the other hand, is his otherness, his holiness, his bigness, his, his I don't understand you, God. And we believe both of these things simultaneously. And to drop one in favor of the other is to commit heresy. So to believe in God's eminence but not hold to his transcendence is to believe in pantheism. God's in the tree, God's in the rock, God is near, but he's not better than us. On the other hand, to believe in God's transcendence but not his eminence is to be a deist, we can't really relate to God. He's there and doesn't really care about us. But as Christians, we hold both of these simultaneously. Simultaneously. And you see it throughout Scripture. In Scripture, you see the burning bush, right? God's there to talk to Moses. And what does God have Moses do? Take your shoes off. God is imminent. He's there, but he's transcendent. So take your shoes off. You see it in the temple. The temple, God's dwelling amongst the nation of Israel, but don't you dare go into the Holy of Holies unless you're the high priest and it's one time a year because he's transcendent. Jesus, here in the flesh, present with his disciples and on the Mount of Transfiguration, he reveals who he really is. In all of his glory, he's transcendent. And when we struggle, when we're faced with anxiety and fear and worry, we tend to run to Jesus' imminence. Jesus, I need comfort, I need encouragement. Be with me in the midst of this. I'm hurting, Lord. Put your arm around me. We want God to be with us. And he has, and he does. The crucifixion and burial of Jesus, not to mention the rest of his life, is clear evidence that our God desires to be with us in the midst of our pain and suffering and to alleviate that pain and suffering. But running to Christ's imminence gives us comfort, but it doesn't necessarily give us courage. That's why his transcendence is important. Look at verse 15. Which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. In order for us to have hope in the midst of anxiety and worry and fear, we need God's eminence, yes, but we need his transcendence as well. The idea of hold until relieve in the military only works if the, if the, the army that's coming to help you is both imminent and transcendent. If it's next to you, if it's close by, if the, if the army that's helping you is right there, able to reach you, but it's like three guys with pitchforks, not super helpful. But if it's the biggest army ever seen, but it can't reach you, also not super helpful. You need both. And so if we're going to hold until relieved, we need a God who is both imminent and transcendent. Christ has to be both. 
for us to be relieved, to be relieved from our sin, relieved of our pain and suffering, because Christ the imminent arrives in the manger, but Jesus the transcendent returns in glory. Jesus the imminent weeps at the death of Lazarus, but Jesus the transcendent brings him back from the dead. Jesus the imminent goes to the cross because he loves us. Jesus the transcendent is raised to life. These aren't two different natures. This is, this is who God is consistently across the board. And many of us, because we run to the Jesus that is imminent to us, but not the transcendent, we're comforted, but we never overcome. We're encouraged, but we never take courage. We're pacified, but we're never powered. We may experience relief, but we will never be relieved. 